Lord, you're wonderful. Lord, you're awesome. Lord, you're kind. Lord, you're magnificent. As we go to your word to preach and to share this morning, I am praying that you would open our hearts to hear, open our hearts to receive, open our hearts to be in tune. So as we share and teach this congregation this morning, God, I thank you for the freedom of worship. I thank you for what's happening in children's and youth all over this place, God. Um, we give you the glory for that. So we bless your name. We magnify you. We worship and we adore you because of who you are. So we bless you and we thank you for what you're doing. You're a wonderful God. Now, Holy Spirit, do what the Holy Spirit does. Move in this place, God, so that you get the praise, the honor, and the glory. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen, amen, amen. You guys doing all right this morning? I'm coming down here and want to teach and talk from here uh, this morning, a little bit this morning, so that God can move and have his way in our midst. Amen. Tiger Woods made a comeback. Can y'all believe that? Come on, y'all. Can you believe that? Yeah, I mean, they had counted him out, hadn't they? They'd counted him out. I mean, he, you figure he was on top of his game in his younger years, and then um, life happened. That's the way I'll say that, right? Because life happens. Come on, y'all. Life happened. He had a series of challenges, failures, so on and so forth. Um, but then later on in life, he came back. And you know why he came back? Because he didn't give up on life. Right? He, he didn't, it didn't matter what the circumstance looked like, how difficult and how challenging it was. He stayed focused and he came back. And here's what I'm learning about a lot of us. As we give up on our lives, we give up on our hopes, we give up on our dreams, we give up on our callings, we give up on the aspirations that God has deposited and placed within us. And more times than often, it's because life happens, right? Stuff in life happens and it continues. And, and more importantly, because things don't happen within the time frame that we expect that they should happen, we get frustrated and we give up in all of that. But does anybody in here know that when all hope seems gone, when you've turned off the light and you've gone to bed and you say enough is enough, never again, that God has the ability to raise you up? Come on, does anybody know that? Yeah. Do me a favor, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God can raise you up. Come on, tell the other neighbor, say, other neighbor, God can raise you up. Amen. On the back end, on the back end of this Easter Sunday morning or Resurrection Sunday, most of you have thought the resurrection was just about Jesus alone. But I want to remind you, in, in sometimes even in this low moments, that just like how he raised Jesus from the dead, he can raise you up. So I want us to revisit this pericope, this little story that's in front of us of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And my hope and prayer is that you see and we see ourselves in it. Because when we seem to want to give up hope, God has a way of raising us up. And I'm so excited about that. I'm excited about that. I think there's a word of encouragement for us all this morning in that. So grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of John chapter 11. Um, I'm going to walk through this story in its entirety. It's going to take me about two Sundays to do that. And so today, I just want to kind of begin the process of walk, walking through this text and reading it and just standing flat-footed and exegeting it and hopefully something will, be, will say, be said that would make sense to you. If you're in John, John chapter 11, verse 1, say amen if you're there. Let me read, let me read verses 1 um, through uh, 16. We'll take those a section at a time and then we'll talk to it. Here's what it says now. A certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, her sister, um, and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was, was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, him who you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two more days. Come on, say two more days. He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? 
And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus done died, y'all. Amen. And for your sake, I like this, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, or some of your translations, Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, I guess, excuse the Ebonics, we all fit in the die with Jesus. <laughs> and he said that, and that's where they went, and that's where they began. So grab your I want to walk through this text. Um, if we can put the first movement on the screen, there's, there's two simple things I want, three things I want to share with the text. But today I just want to share two with you, if we can make it that far, in hopes that you see yourself in it, and in hopes that we realize that God can do some miraculous things in our lives. Number one, this is difficult to digest and it's difficult to deal with, but you need to understand this morning that God is glorified when we learn the truth that we are on his time, not ours. Okay, very, very important. God is glorified with the truth when we learn the truth that we are on his time, not ours. Let me say it again. When we are on his time, not ours. Okay, my problem with God is that his time clock does not align with mine's. You should have said mine either. Because I think I'm comfortable in saying none of us can force God to anything. Does that make sense? And so we need to understand this morning we're not on, 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 on our time. We are on his time. And we have to learn what that means to adjust to the time of God. I think this is a great example to let us see that even when we have given up on him, God has the ability and capacity to raise us up. So I want to walk you through the principles of this text, hopefully to reveal a little more about who God is. So as we go through this half, second half of the year, we can see that God is a great God, right? So put the next slide on the scene. I want to walk you through what I refer to as the A, B, C, and D of this first section of the text, right? And as we look at the text, let me read um, that I want us to understand uh, real quick that even though we're not on God's time clock, hear the statement going. Our personal relationship with God, it has no impact on him adjusting for us. Y'all don't get that yet. Come on, if you get it, I, okay, so, so listen, listen, listen. I'm married to Pastor Katani, right? And we've been married for a long, long time, longer than some of y'all been born, right? Long time. So because you've been married so long, when I call, well, let me, let me flip, let me flip, let me flip. I am married to her. So because you've been married so long, if she calls me, I better show up. <laughs> Notice I flipped that because if I call her, yeah, y'all get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if she calls me, come on, church, guess what I better do? I better show up, right? So I adjust um, our relationship has an impact on me adjusting to her time frame because of the relationship. It does not work that way with God. I want us to understand God for a moment. And there's good news in this. So look at the text. Here's how the text opens up, verse 1. Watch it, verse 1 through 3, very, very carefully. Now, a certain man was ill, okay? My translation has a comma. A certain man, meaning he has no name, he has no identity, he has no relevance as the text opens up. And then the next phrase names the man that was ill. It says his name happens to be Lazarus, and then it connects him to a location. And the location that it connects him to is this town called Bethany. And then there's a comma. Now you have a Lazarus that's from Bethany. Now Bethany now is now identified with some people. Notice what it says. It was the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So you've got, you've got um, a man named Lazarus. You've got a town named Bethany. You've got a woman there Mary, named Mary and a woman named Martha. But it doesn't stop there. And now it defines further who Mary is. Notice what it says. This is the same Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair 
And now it connects Lazarus to Mary, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Okay, you guys get this. So the author has given us all that detail to say that these are no ordinary people. These are people who had inside connections with Jesus. Lazarus is sick. And because Mary had tithed faithfully a whole lot of money in wiping Jesus' feet with her hair, she fully expected that now when I call in a favor, <laughs> come on, y'all, with me, Jesus would respond. So, 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 so the author gives us all these painstaking details. And then verse 3 says, So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, him who you love is what? Ill. Ill. Okay? Now, don't be so hard on the sisters because I want us to kind of see ourselves in the text as we kind of move through this a little bit so we can understand what it's saying. Because here's my thing. I, I, I pray. I worship. I seek God, I read my word, I spend time in the presence of God, I would consider myself having an intimate, personal relationship with God, I would add to that phrase, I've been saved a long, 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 long time. So guess what? When I find myself in crisis and I call on God, my expectation is he better show up. Y'all talk to me. Because believe it or not, whether, whether or not it's expressively stated, the reason some of us are so committed to God is we want to position ourselves so that when things go wrong, we can call in a favor. I wish I had a church that would just say amen every now and then and quit acting like they hadn't done that. Are you with me? And then, and then my problem with God and the reason I stop praying and the reason I stop reading and the reason I stop going and the reason I stop giving and the reason I get discouraged and do all that stuff is when I pick up the phone and I dial 111, that's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and none of them responds? This is how I blame God. Forget you church people. <laughs> Can we be honest this morning, right? And we go there with him. So look at the text. Look at what it says here, secondly. So, so I want you to, our relationship has no impact on adjusting his time frame, okay? Now, watch the second thing in the text. Look at what the second thing says. The providence of God mandates now that all of our experiences work together for his good or for the glory of God so that God can let glory of it. I'll explain, I'll explain. Look at verse 4. So they have this tight relationship. They said to the Lord and said to him, hey, our brother is sick. Can you come handle this? And notice what verse 4 said. But when Jesus heard it, here's what he said. This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Now the author even adds, don't get it twisted. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to the disciples, let us go again to Judea. Okay, verse 4. When he heard and had learned that Lazarus was sick, he says, this illness is not unto death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. And then the author says, this one troubles me. He loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to his disciples, all right, let's go handle this. That's troubling to me. Okay? Now, it wasn't like the message did not reach Jesus. The message got to him. You would think... Based on all the details that John gives us about the descriptive of Jesus' relationship with these individuals, that the moment he had received the word, come on, after all, he was God. He could have just kept sleeping and waved the finger and said, be healed and go back to bed. Come on, y'all. I mean, he is God, right? He could have done anything he wanted to to fix the situation. But here's what he says. Here's what he said. The moment the word came to him in the midst of their crisis and word reached him, here's what he looked at. He says, oh, it's all good. 
It's not going to kill him. God's going to get the glory. Then he just lays there and kept eating barbecue for two more days. Like some of us would say, let me finish this plate. <laughs> that trips me out, right? That trips me out. Because here's, what, here, here's the thing I want you all to hear this in this. Sometimes you, well, let me go here, let me go here. The reason you are alive and the reason you are watching me and the reason you are in the presence of God today and in this place worshiping God is not like you hadn't gone through anything, okay? I think I'm comfortable in saying we've all gone through something, but lock into this. The reason you're still here is because the thing didn't kill you. Oh, come on, somebody ought to say amen here. Some, the, the, thing, the thing didn't kill you. That's why you're still here. And here's what Jesus is saying. In our crisis is not his urgent situation. Oh, hear that, hear that. Because here's what we find ourselves. Because I'm about to lose my job, I got spiritual, and I'm crying, and I'm seeking God. I'm sick, and my prognosis is the doctors don't know what's going to happen, and I'm crying, and I'm seeking God. My marriage is in calamity, and I'm crying, and I'm seeking God. My financial situation is not where it ought to be, and I'm saying, God, you better step in. And watch God in his coolness. You'll be all right. And why is he saying you're going to be all right? Because it's not about you. It's about him being glorified to the thing that you're going. I wish I had somebody in here. So here's how Romans says it. All things work together for the good of those who love God, who are the call according to his purpose. So every now and then, God too has, has a, to allow us to go through some things so we can have a deeper revelation of who he is. And if he shows up too quick, we won't really know who he is. That's the problem with some of our bad children today. We show up too quick. And they don't learn the lesson. Daddy will be there. Mama will be there. And we deliver them from so quick that their expectation is, you better show up when I do something wrong to rescue me. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Our timing is not God's timing. God will allow you. He will allow me. He will allow us to go through the fire. Listen to this. Not to punish us. Don't hear me say punish. I am not saying that. Not to punish us, but to let us have a deeper revelation of who he really is. Let me tell you why I'm saying that. Because if every time you're hungry, he gives you bread, all you're going to know him is as a bread maker. Come on. If it's every time you're thirsty, he gives you water, your definition of him is going to be a thirst quencher. Come on. If every time you're in struggle, he makes a way out of nowhere, here's how you're going to refer to him as the one who makes a way out of nowhere. But God doesn't want you to box him in. He doesn't want you to define him as only this way. So sometimes he will stop making a way so you can I, I wish I had somebody in here because at the end of that thing you'll know him differently these deep girls Jesus probably slept in their house they fed him Come on. Matter of fact, they defined the town because it says whenever he went to Bethany to run revival service, he did not have to stay at the local Holiday Inn. He had a room built just for him at their home in Bethany. There was an intimate relationship. Yet when they called him, <sighs> I'm hoping this helped you understand that because you call God doesn't mean that he has to show up. I, ho I hope you're hearing this, okay? Because here's what we say in our spirituality. I'm going to obligate God to respond. And God's like, obligate yourself. Move me, right? Because at the end of this, here's what you're going to learn about me. You can't force me to nothing. Providence belongs to me. So I'm going to allow you to go through the storm. Because at the end of the storm, here's what you're going to understand. It doesn't matter what the storm looked like. I can bring you out. 
I wish I had somebody here. That's what I'm trying to get us all to understand, that God can raise you up. It all works together for his glory. Come on, say he, it works for his glory. Say it again, say it works for his glory. So watch this, and I don't have time to deal with this. I want to get, I want to, get to, to the bottom of this. So notice what it says here, the third thing, right? Watch the, the C. It says, so we need to seize the moment when working with God to be on mission with him. So here's what he said to his disciples. Look at this one. He says here now, um, the disciples said to him, verse 8, um, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, are they not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Okay? Here, here, here's the long and short of this. I don't want to spend, we're going to deal with this a little more Wednesday. Time is short. And so here's what God is saying. Seize the moment. Okay, God, this is Jesus. This is weird. Okay? We were just in Jerusalem. And the people tried to stone you because your time wasn't right. Now, and you ran, that's why you're where you are, because your timing wasn't yet. Now, Lazarus is sick, and you want to go back there where they just stoned you? And here's what God says. Jesus said, you must understand those God moments in your life. When you're in a God moment... There is nothing the enemy can do to take you out. Are you hearing me this morning? When you're in a God moment, there is, they could just been trying to, to fire bullets at you a few minutes ago. But if it's a God moment where God wants to do something, and you're going to see it in a little while, there is nothing the enemy can, can do to take you out. So seize those moments of God. Come on, say seize the moment. Say it again. Say seize the moment. So look at the last thing. So here's what he does. He intentionally delays. He intentionally delays his intervention to do what? To now put us on his time. He delays his intervention to align clocks. And here's what he does. He takes the wristband off of your hand and he grabs the little thing and he says, okay, I'm going to adjust you to me and I'm going to give you my time. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to adjust you to me. And I'm going to put you on my time. So then notice what he says in verse 11. Watch verse 11 through 16. And we're going to jump to the bottom part of it. So after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus is falling asleep, but I go to awake him. Okay. Remember with me. Remember with me. Jesus said, well, let me, let me show you this. I go to awake him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he had fallen asleep, he will recover. Come on, Jesus. He's asleep. He's going to be good. Look at verse 13. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking a rest in sleep. So then Jesus told them plainly, bunch of idiots. Lazarus is dead. Watch this next phrase. And for whose sake? For whose sake? Come on, say, for whose sake? The 12 guys who were walking with him, seeing him done the miraculous, still had no idea what he could do in this dead situation. So y'all think I'm delaying for Mary and Martha. Oh, Jesus. I'm really delaying for you <laughs> because you're following me for the wrong reason, even though you've been following me a long time. Oh, come on, y'all got to get this, right? So even for your sake, he says, for your sake, um, and he says, and I am glad that I was not there so that who? You may do what? Hold up. We believe you, Jesus. No, you don't. You're saying you know me, but you really don't. Is this making sense? Right? Now watch the next thing. Watch the next thing. This is an important phrase. This is, so he says, but let us go with him. Now notice, notice Thomas, and I'll explain Thomas in a little while, and then we're going to pick this up, up next week. So notice what Thomas says. So Thomas called the twin Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, hey, y'all, let's go too. Why? So we may die with him. 
Okay? So when he shows up, they're going to stone him. And if they're going to stone him, they're going to know we are associated with him, so they're going to stone us too. I'm saying that for a reason. Okay? So now let's flip the script and look at the back end of this. Turn to the next slide, and then let's walk this out. So go to the next slide. I want you to second. So here's the thing. God is glorified when we recognize Jesus as more than a way maker, but as the resurrection and life. That's the important thing I want you all to hear. God can raise you up. A lot of us hear that, but we don't believe it. Let me tell you why we don't believe it. Because when crisis comes, we still expect him to show up. When we're in calamity, we still expect him to show up, right? And here's the reason we have prayer requests. Y'all pray for me because I'm going through this thing, and we quote scriptures, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. So if all of us can lock arms and seek God, God's going to respond. And God says, my timing is different than your timing, because when I do something, it's not about you, it's about God getting the glory and others getting a revelation of who I really am. Now check this out. You already have a revelation to some extent because you're praying. There's others that have not been introduced to me yet that I've got to wait for the crowd to get there. Oh, my gosh. Y'all lost. Go to the next slide. Let's read. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. So time bears no factor on his ability to bring life to dead situation. Y'all repeat on me. Say time, time. bears no factor, bears no factor. on Jesus' ability to bring life to our dead situation. In English, it doesn't matter how long it's been, he can still do it. <sighs> Verse 17. When Jesus came, okay, now watch this, he found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for how long? Four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about how far? Two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother, uh, concerning their brother. Let me stop there, okay? When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb four days. Let me explain something. Where Jesus was, as it relates to his perspective to, to, um, to Jerusalem or to Bethany, was about a day's, uh, two days' journey away. So here's what that meant. A day's journey away. So he stayed two days. Remember when he got the word, he laid down for two more days. So here's what that means. By the time word had gotten to him initially, Lazarus was already dead. By the time the message got to him, Lazarus was already dead. So he stayed two more days. Then at the end of the third day, here's what he says. Now let us make the journey to where Jesus is. So here's what Jesus did. He stayed, I mean, thank you, thank you, where Lazarus, I'm still on Easter, to where, to where Lazarus. Jesus intentionally delayed for four days. Jesus, why did you delay for four days? Well, Jewish custom was this. They believe that when a person died, they had this tradition historically and culturally, that the spirit would hang around the outside of that person for three days. Gain, looking to gain entrance, but if a fourth day came, decomposition had begun, and the Spirit would then make its journey, come on, to Sheol. So here's what Jesus says. I'm going to wait four days to guarantee that sure enough, Lazarus is dead, so when I show up, you can't say it was a fluke. I wish I had somebody here. I wish... And then look at the text, look at the text. It says, he says here, when he got there, notice the next part that it says. It says that the Jews, many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console him concerning their brother. So and notice what the text says. Bethany was two miles away from where um, Jerusalem was. So here's what happens. A two-mile journey is a short walk for Jews. And when the Bible says Jews, it's not talking about friends of God. It's talking about the enemies of Jesus. So here's what John's trying to communicate. He got to Bethany and he waited longer still so that all the mourners from Jerusalem could have time to get to Bethany to mourn the loss, right? So here's the thing. Here's what the author's saying. By the time he got there, the crowd was there, okay? Now you understand Thomas. 
Lord, if we go there, they're going to stone us. Why would you say something like that, Thomas? Because you're wasting time. It's two days, and the longer we stay here, the more people will show up. If you're going to do something, let's just sneak in so we can. I wish I had somebody in here. So, so, and, and so, so when Jesus said, let's go, here's what Thomas, all right, the crowd's there, and they're going to see us anyway. So if we show up, guess what they do? They're going to stone him, and they stone us. It's too late. Now, here's Jesus' intentionality. He wanted the crowd. I wish I had somebody to be there. Because here's what you want to do. You want to go through your thing all by yourself and you wonder why people don't know Jesus. You've got cancer and nobody knows about it but you and you wonder why Jesus won't show up. You're going through a heartache in life and nobody knows about it but you and you wonder why Jesus won't show up. I wish I had somebody. You lost your job and nobody knows about it but you and you wonder why Jesus won't show up. Jesus is not concerned with you. He wants that when he restores, the multitude would see what he did so they can have a relationship with him. So he waits and he lingers and he hangs out and he waits and he lingers because he knows when I raise Lazarus, it's not about Lazarus. It's about the bystanders saying, dang. And so when God raises you up, it's not about you being quiet. It's about the world saying about you, dang, God can do that for you. Imagine, I wish I had somebody in here. Imagine what, because the Bible said his goal is the world, not me individually. So he waited, he waited, he waited. And I'm done. I'm going to pick this up. Look at the next thing. So location bears no factor on Jesus' ability to bring life. Say location. There's no factor. Y'all bear with me. We'll get there. We'll get there. So watch this. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. Now you have to get this right. She left where she was and traveled to meet Jesus, where Jesus was hanging out. And then, but Mary remained seated in the house. We'll talk about that Wednesday. Here's what Martha said. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Okay? But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, he will give you. Okay? I'm going to come back to verse 23. A lot of our problems with God is we feel he has to be here or near for him to work. And I'm going to correct a theological fallacy real quick. Anybody know that God is transcendent and God is eminent? I'll explain. He's far away in the heavens, but yet and still he's near. Right? Here's what scripture says. David, where can I go to flee your presence? If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I send to the heavens, you're there. With God, there is no hiding place. So here's what I'm trying to say. Don't make the mistake of thinking there is a place in the earth where God never is. Because she don't know him herself. If you were here, you'd have released the word and he would not have died. And Jesus just looks at her and say, location has no impact on my ability. Now let me help you all. Here's what we do. We come to worship, and because it's a down moment, Jesus ain't here. What do you mean? Is he God or is he not God? Is there a place where he's at or where he's never at? I wish I had somebody. The issue isn't him. The issue is not realizing where he is and worshiping him for who he is, right? So your worst nightmare, our worst storm, our worst crisis he is always there. Hear what I've been saying to you all day long. The issue is not my time clock. It's his time clock on when he manifests his presence. Does this make sense? Let me help you why I'm saying that. Because look at the last thing. So watch, watch. He says, and then we're going to stop here. And then we're going to go to a time of prayer. Because notice what, 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 Jesus, what she said. So Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Okay? Future tense. Right? So Martha said to him, I know he will 
rise again. And then she puts a time frame on the future aspect of that verb rise. In the resurrection on the last day. He's going to get up, Jesus. I know that. I've been around you. And I know you're supposed to go back to your father. And I know you're going to consummate time at the end of time. And you're going to come back. And when you come back, I know you're going to raise all the dead. I know that. But he's already dead. So in the last day, he's going to come. So I know you weren't here present tense. Now that you showed up, I know what you're going to do future tense. I wish I had somebody. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. And look at what he said. Look at what he said. Look at what he said. He said, Jesus said to her, if you knew me, you'd know that I am. I am. The what? And the what? And then watch this. He who believes in me, what? Though he were dead, yet he shall what? And everyone who lives and believes in me shall do what? Never die. And he says, do you believe this? Let me not even read the rest. Say, I am. Let me help you all with this. When Moses was in the wilderness and God was calling him, Moses said, who do I tell Pharaoh that you are? Which one are you? And then God didn't say, all right, tell him this one. He just simply said, I am that I am in Hebrew, right? So in other words, don't go to Pharaoh and say, hey, Pharaoh, you got the rain God. You got the snow God. Well, they didn't have snow. But you've got the fertility God. You got all this stuff, right? You kind of get what I'm saying. So you just can't do that with Pharaoh. You got to say to him, I am has sent me. What do you mean? In Greek, here's what I am means, that Greek verb. The ever-present tense of the verb to be. Let me explain. It's present tense. Come on, say present tense. It's not future. It's present. So that means wherever I am, I can take your yesterday and make it today. I wish I had. I can take your future and make it today. So by virtue of the fact that I'm here, And if you understand what I just said with the transcendence and the eminence of God, he really never leaves. I'm saying something heavy here that I want you all to get, okay? So here's what I'm saying to you, Martha. Here's what I'm saying to you in this moment. By virtue of the fact that you are confronting me through my lens, Lazarus is not dead. Oh, my gosh. Y'all ain't ready for this. Humanistically speaking, the doctors have signed his death certificate. But even though I'm here right now, I can go to the eschaton and see him alive and call him back into time. I wish I had somebody. (laughs) Y'all like it. Because here's what we do. Here's what we do. We give up too quick. Here's what I said to y'all when I began. Tiger won a championship, right? Everybody had written him off. He's too old. He's too that. And God could do whatever he wanted to do. And God went into time and took that old, decapitated, messed up somebody who had written him off and brought him back into time and put him on that court and showed what God could do. Here's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, what yesterday looks like. God can raise you up because he's a present tense God. He's a right now God. It doesn't matter how bad it looks. He can restore right now because he is what he is. He is God all by himself. You got to get that. You got to get that. So the prayer ought to be like this. God, it looks bad right now. So when you get ready, I'm ready. Ah. Yeah. And so my faith is maintained. My commitment is maintained. But if I don't know who he is, I'll expect him to move on my time clock. And when he doesn't, I get disheartened. And my disheartenment ought to be a revelation to me that I really don't know him. I've done that. Come on, y'all. We've all done that. Come on now, here's what God does. The marriage is ended. God, why didn't you show up? 
you must not have the ability. Job is lost. The sickness has taken the loved one. God, why didn't you show up? You must not have the ability. And then we said this. Had God intervened? And God says, my intervention occurs when, when I'm ready to intervene. And here's what I want you to hear me say. It doesn't matter how long it is. When he shows up, it's his time. Here's the difficulty in everything that I'm saying to you. When he stays away, it's not because he can't. It's because he wants to form me and he wants to form you. Because if he keeps bailing me out of jail, I'll keep going back to jail. But if I sit in jail and think a little bit, if I've got to sit hungry and think about it for a little while, come on, y'all. If I've got to sit lonely and think about it for a little while, I process differently. And I see him in those lonely moments. I see him in those depressing times, such that when he decides to manifest, it's present tense. And he can have his way. Repeat out of me. Say, self, God can raise me up. Come on again. Say, self, God can raise me up. Come on, worship team. Come on, back. I know the hour is late, so be patient with me. I just need to share this. Come on, y'all. Let them come. I think God wants to say something to us through this word. What it looks like right now, here's what I'm going to say this prophetically. What it looks like right now is not what it really is. It's what we're seeing humanistically. The timing of God is completely different. From Mary's and Martha's and that entire Jewish community and his disciples, from their vantage point, the Spirit had gone Lazarus was in the grave. You're going to see next week. Here's what um, Mary said. He stinks by now. And Jesus pretty much says, so what? Because <laughs> a lot of us are looking at our situation. It stinks. And he says, so what? If you knew who I am. Ah. Holy Spirit, you're God. Holy Spirit, you're wonderful. Holy Spirit, you're gracious. Holy Spirit, you're merciful, you're kind. And we hear you can raise us up. We hear you can do the miraculous. But we wrestle with that. Because we have a story of what you haven't done yet. And so God, move in this place. As we process what you're teaching us, God. To get to the place where we can believe you and recognize who you are and trust you for who you are. So as your word has gone forth, God, let it marinate. Let people hear. Let them receive. We give this to you, God. And if there's one, if there's one, if there's one that needs to come to this altar this morning and pray and say, God, reveal yourself to me. Do it, Jesus. Do it, Jesus. Do it, Jesus. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. Stand to your feet this morning. As you stand to your feet, Pastor Gatani is going to minister, but as she ministers, I want you to just take a moment to pray and say, God, show me me. Show me myself in the midst of this as I give myself to you. Bless your Lord. Amen. Bless your Lord.